Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you, God, for how great you are. We thank you, God, that you care about every detail in our lives, Lord. We thank you, God, that you love us so very much, Lord Jesus. And we pray, God, you just be with all of our families, all of our loved ones, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord God, that you just, just put your hand upon them, Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, for Susan's sister and for her parents as they, they are have been caregivers for for 56 years now and and um just put your hand on them lord god just give them strength as they as they try to help her through this lord jesus and just be with them as they try to help her with just the regular day-to-day -day tasks at this point lord just just put your hand on them lord god just give them strength lord jesus and we just thank you and we praise you god and we lift you up on high and we give you all the glory this day we pray, God, as we look at your word, open your word to us, Lord God. Show us who you are. Show us how great you are, Lord God. Show us, Lord Jesus, how awesome and amazing you are, Lord God. And I pray, Jesus, that you will just, just reveal to us who you are and how we move closer to you and how we move forward in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We praise you, God. We give you all the glory, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, for all the kids as they're heading back to school this week. We pray, Jesus, for the ones like me that you to cry myself to sleep before school went back and the ones that are super excited we pray god you would just be with them lord and just as this new year comes along and the teachers are getting ready and the kids are getting ready and the homeschooled kids are getting sorted we pray jesus that you will just just be with all of these kids as they head into this next chapter lord lord in your precious and holy name amen this used to be the worst weekend of the entire year Oh, remember one day, I was laying in bed on the Monday night of heading into, into Tuesday to go back to school, crying my eyes out, saying to my mom, I just want to go back to the beginning of the summer. And she goes, but if we go back to the beginning of the summer, then we won't ever get to Christmas. And I'm like, I can live without Christmas. I don't want to go back. I don't, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to school. Oh, I hated school. Oh, it was terrible. Oh, yeah, I was willing to give up Christmas, my birthday, everything, just so we didn't have to go back to school. But she made me go. Oh, man, isn't that child abuse or something? Oh, man. Then I got kids that like school. I don't know. I don't know, Josh. Moving forward. We've got to move forward. We've got to give it, leave it behind. Forget the past. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ has first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Sometimes we like to get relaxed when we're driving. Sometimes we like to, to take it easy. This is my plan. I'm taking a lazy boy chair with me and going to Myrtle Beach, just like, just like Mr. Bean. Actually, one time, we, um, my grandma was moving up from Virginia, and um, we had a rental van, rental truck, and two seats, and my dad... My brother-in-law and I were riding down to to Virginia. So my dad's like, I'm bringing my lazy boy chair. So he takes the lazy boy chair and he puts it in the back of the truck. And he puts it right by that little door where he can sneak between the two. And he's sitting in the chair and everything's fine. And then he puts the, he puts the feet up and when we accelerated, the chair went right over backwards. And in the rear view mirror, all you could see was his feet sticking up like this in the back. Then when we packed the truck, we packed it so the door, the chair was right there so he could sit in it then. But it was so funny when we accelerated and he fell right over backwards and and um, we just let him, let him roll around back there for a little while. But sometimes we get really comfortable while we're riding. Sometimes we get so comfortable we might even fall asleep while we're riding. And we may not allow the things around us to affect us but we might affect everybody around us because we might get ourselves lazy. We might get ourselves so comfortable that we, we were, we're, not, we're, we're, not, we're not of any real 
good or help to anybody. But the reality is we can't become so comfortable with where we are that we just turn on the cruise control or the autopilot and we just hang in there. We need to excel. We need to push ourselves. We need to keep moving forward and moving forward. We can't hold on to the status quo. We can't be satisfied with where we are. We can't just get comfortable. But what we need to do is we need to walk in a state of dissatisfaction with where we are and be looking for more, looking to move forward, looking for greater. We got to be dissatisfied with where we are with Christ. We can't be content with where we are. We need to be like Paul was saying, pressing on to the goal, pressing on for more, looking more forward. He says, I have not reached the perfection yet. I need to keep going. I need to keep pushing. I need to keep trying. We can't walk in an attitude of saying, how much I read the Bible last year, how much I prayed last year, how much I gave last year, how much I served last year, how much I worshiped last year, that was enough. We need to be pushing on saying that wasn't enough. I got to worship him even more. I need to read more of the word. I need to spend more time in his presence. I need to serve him more. We need to keep pushing and pushing and wanting more of him and saying, uh, what I've got is I'm not, I'm not quite happy enough. We can't find ourselves in a comfort zone holding on and being comfortable being right there. A comfortable spot or a comfort zone is somewhere where we become lazy. It's a spot where we say that I'm satisfied with what I've got. I'm satisfied with where I am. I don't need to go any further. I've heard people say, well, as much as they're in love with Jesus, I don't think I want that much. And you stand there and you, I, I remember hearing that from two different people over the years, talking about another person, about how much they're in love with Jesus. Ah, I don't know if I want that much. And you stand there and you think, what? How could you not want more of Jesus? How could you not want to go further? It's because they were so much in the comfort zone, they were asleep. We need to be willing to take chances. We need to be willing to go all in. We need to be willing to give it all. He doesn't want us just to sit at the, at, the, at the start line, sitting next to some big Mustang, thinking, oh, I'll never be able to beat that. I'll never be able to, never be able to live up to that. Because we serve a God that is more powerful than, than all creation. He's the one that made creation. Through him, all things are possible. For those who love him and are called by his name, there's no reason why you can't excel in him. We don't look at the situation around us and think, well, I can't, I can't go any further. I watched this guy on YouTube. This guy's name's Kyle. And... He had this great idea, and he bought a Tesla. They're not exactly the cheapest cars in the world, and he didn't buy just the one that most people have. He got the Tesla Plaid, and he wanted to break the world record with the Tesla. But the problem was, the rule is you can't modify the drivetrain, meaning the, in the motors, the battery. You had to use the custom battery, and you had to use the custom motors. So he said, okay, let's make the car lighter. So he stripped everything off of it. Everybody was like, just the, the window that sits on the roof of that thing is like $20,000. Ridiculous. And it had a crack in it. So he stripped everything down, put a rolled cage into it, and tried to break the world record. He fell short terribly. So he's like, okay, what's the problem? So he took it to a wind tunnel, he put it in, and found out that the wind resistance was affecting the weight reduction. So they got sheet metal and they put tin in the thing. And he kept missing the world record by a hundredth of a second. And he couldn't pass it. So he called it the driver mod. He called his friend, I don't know if you can see it, in the bottom right corner, he called his friend that is about four feet shorter and a hundred pounds lighter. And he called it the driver mod. And he knocked a hundred pounds out of the weight of the car by putting his 
dwarf friend? Is that the right word I'm supposed to use nowadays? He put his dwarf friend in there. They'd move the seat up, move the pedals to him, and they broke the world record. So the guy in the red shirt that owns the car, he now owns, has the world record for the fastest MR2. It's a, it's a gas-powered car. And now he holds the world record for the fastest, um, the fastest Tesla Plaid. He did not want second place. He wanted first place. It was actually just it was just on Monday, like like six days ago, he broke the world record with this thing. And he he didn't want second. Same thing with the MR2 car that he has. It's a, it, it, he changed, he put it, that one he's allowed to change the motor, he put a different motor in, it, this and that and the other thing, he did all this stuff. And he now holds the record. Well, he had the record. I don't know if he's lost it since, but he had the record for a while of the fastest of that car because he didn't want to settle. He couldn't settle. He just he, he kept pushing and pushing and pushing, and now he holds two world records. We can't get so satisfied with where we are. We can't compare ourselves to those around us. If I compare myself to George, and I just came, made up a name, if I compare myself to George, I might be able to get as close to God as he is. I might be able to be more godly than he is. But the thing is, I'm not supposed to compare myself to George. I'm supposed to be comparing myself to Christ. And if we compare ourselves to Christ, that's a whole different level. That is a level that, that it's, it's like that little smart car that was in the video that, that took off. That's who we're comparing ourselves to. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25, keep in mind, Peter is the guy that wrote this. This is the guy that walked on water. This is the guy that was there when Jesus raised the dead. This is the guy that was there for the transfiguration. This is who writes this. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering. Just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threatened revenge when he was suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on that Christ, on that cross, so that we can be dead to sin. We live for what is right, and by his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your soul. He knew full well that Jesus had never sinned. He knew full well that, that, that Jesus never retaliated. He never threatened revenge. He left it in the hands of our Lord. He left it with Jesus. Or Jesus left it with his Father. Peter knew because Peter saw it. If we're careful, we might hold back. If we're not careful, we might hold back. We might look at the situations of our past. We might look at the, the way that people have treated us. And we might say, oh, I'm not going to go any further. People might not be nice to us from time to time. People might treat us poorly from time to time. People might, might, might tear us down from time to time. They might make it their, their, their purpose just to make your life difficult. But Christ went through some difficult times. They crucified him. And yet he kept pushing on for the pushing on for the goal. He kept going forward. He kept serving the Lord as the Lord asked him to. We need to keep our eyes on him. And he is the one that won that victory. We cannot live our lives looking back at our past. We can't live our lives looking back at what, what people have done to us. We can't live our lives looking back at the way people treated us. We can't live, live our lives looking back at the way things went poorly. But we also can't live our lives looking back at the good, looking back at the, the, the great things, looking back at, oh, I just wish it was like that. Oh, I wish it was, it, it could be like that. Oh, it used to be so wonderful. 
Because good memories can hold us back just as bad as bad memories because it's never going to be the same as it was. My prayer is that it is never the same as it was, that it's greater in the future. We cannot be satisfied. We cannot live in a state of being satisfied. We gotta live in a state of dissatisfaction so that we're always looking for more, wanting to go deeper, wanting more of Jesus, going deeper with him, letting him be our king in every aspect of our lives. Number two, we need to find some devotion. Back to our passage, verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it yet, but I focus on one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Paul's trying to tell us something here. He's trying to tell us, go deeper with him. Mark 10, verse 21, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for this guy. Looking at, this was the rich young ruler, Jesus looked at him and he just, he so much appreciated this young man. The young man comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do? Since my youth, I have been devoted to God. I have put everything I've got. And Jesus looked at him and says, actually, you haven't. You haven't put everything in. There's one thing you still haven't done. And it wasn't a matter of giving everything he had to the poor. The point was is that he was hanging on to and putting his trust in his worldly possessions rather than putting his trust in the Lord. The point wasn't the giving, the point was the giving up. The point was putting Jesus ahead of his idol. His idol was his expectations and reliances on his possessions. Go and sell your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. All this guy did was look at his outward stuff, but he didn't look at his Lord. He, wouldn't put it, he wasn't putting his trust in Jesus. He was putting his trust in himself and his own things. Jesus wants us to have a heart devoted deep inside, deep down. He wants us to, to put him first. Great devotion. Jesus is at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. He's teaching away. They're having a wonderful time. And they're... they're are the two ladies, Mary and Martha. One is making dinner and one is sitting at his feet. And Martha comes over and says to him, don't you realize I'm doing all the work and there's Mary just sitting on her tuff? Luke 10, 41 and 42. But the Lord said to her, dear Martha, you're worried and upset over these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary's discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Mar Martha was putting details, putting the, the, the stuff ahead of her Lord. And Jesus looked at her and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to take that away from her. She's figured out that, that spending time at Jesus' feet was more important than the details. Is my heart that devoted? Psalm 27 verse four, there's one thing I ask of the Lord. The thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfection and meditating in his temple. This is David. This is David. David is called a man after God's own heart. Even in the New Testament, years after, he's still called the man after God's own heart. It's David's throne that Jesus is sitting on. David went and had an affair with Bathsheba, had Bathsheba's husband put to death. He was a mess. David was a mess. David goes and counts his army when God clearly tells him not to do it. David wants to have, a, have the guy who stole Bathsheba wanted to have him put to death for stealing the other guy's sheep and he finds that he's the one that was the one that was in the wrong. Suddenly he changes his tune and he is the man for God's own heart. Why? Because he Though he may have failed from time to time, though he may have let God down from time to time, though he might have even, he committed murder. Yet, 
He repented and he kept going after his Lord, kept pushing on towards God, saying, I want you. You and I, we might stumble from time to time. We might sin from time to time. We might let people down from time to time. The reality is, Jesus is the only one that's ever lived, never sinning. But we have a God that will forgive us and give us the strength the next time and give us strength and help the next time. Of all David's shortcomings, he still was considered a man after God's own heart. Paul, he told us, I focus on one thing. I focus on one thing as pressing on towards the goal, pressing on towards my father. He didn't just take his life and compartmentalize it. He didn't just take it and put it into categories. So often we, 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 we focus on our lives and we have, we've got work, we've got our hobbies, we've got our past, we've got our, 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 our money, our security, our health, our family, our friends. And we, we have these and we're always trying to jockey how to, how to keep all of them happy and how to keep them all in the right place. And we put Jesus in the center. But the problem with putting Jesus in the center, how does Jesus get up to the top corner where work is? How does Jesus get to our hobbies? Because other parts get in the way. So we try to rearrange them. Even at that, our future, on the, on the, the, the thing that I made, the future still only just got a tiny bit of Jesus. How do we get Jesus to be a part of every part of it? Well, Jesus is actually the one that's supposed to be holding it all together. He's actually the box that's supposed to be holding it all together. And everything that we have should be in him. We put him first, and then our work, our hobbies, our finances, our friends, our everything, our family. Then Jesus becomes the center of it all. Jesus becomes the all-consuming one. We put everything through him, remembering that he comes first and we keep our eyes on him and that he is more interested in you succeeded than, than you are interested in succeeding. He is interested that you succeed. He wants you to. We need to be devoted to him. One of the problems we have today is that we're so busy we're so busy, we want the, the McDonald's fast food microwave life. 12 seconds to warm up this and 15 seconds to do that. And oh my goodness, I went to McDonald's and it took me three minutes to get through the drive through I'm going to sue them. It took me three minutes to get through the drive through My coffee was then too hot. I burned myself. I'm going to sue them. I gave them three minutes to do the job and they didn't do it well enough. We live in a life where we want it now, but we want it our way. In our lives, we're so busy on Monday. We're off doing this on Tuesday. It's cheap movie night, so we go to the movies. On Wednesday, we, we, we go to the gym. We work out. On Thursday, we've got to do our shopping. On Friday, that's the day we do our hobby. Saturday, we do all of our errands and our, and our, our yard work and our, our projects and everything like that. Well, then Sunday, we're so tired, we don't have time for God. So Sunday, we sleep in. We don't put him first. We don't even put him second. We don't even put him seventh. Where do we put him? Where does he fit into all of this? How long would a marriage last if we only served our wives or our, our husbands, if we only served them in spurts, if we're only committed at times when it was convenient? What if we kept other priorities on the side for the other days? How long would a marriage last if we only spent Sunday for two hours with our spouse. But we have something else on the side for the other six days. How would that work? We're supposed to have Jesus first and then the rest of the things fall into place. Dale Moody, who was a preacher back 100 years ago, 
he was preaching at something and a whole bunch of people were there in Chicago. And as he preached, he says, okay, now I want everybody to go home and I want you to think about this. I'm not going to give anybody an opportunity to get saved today. I'm going to wait till next week and you can come back. And once you've decided whether or not you want to be serve the Lord, you can decide then. I want you a week to think about it. What just so happened that week, half the city of Chicago burned down. And a whole bunch of people that were at that service died between the two services. Deal Moody was shaken to his core because people that he should have asked if they were ready to give their hearts to the Lord were now standing before him. And he didn't do it. He said, I'll never do that again. He went on to preach and two continents were shaken for the Lord through his ministry. We need to find some devotion. Who are we devoted to? Number three, we need to find some direction. Back to our passage, verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what is past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Paul knew how important it was to have direction, to have a focus, to have a goal, to know where he was headed. He's leaving this behind and he's moving forward. If we lived our lives always looking back over our shoulders, always looking back at what's behind us, we're going to leave it all back there. We're going to live back there. We're going we're to look forward and want what was back there. We've got to leave what's back there. We've got to leave it behind. I remember one time we were sitting there with all Susan's aunts and uncles and they used to like to get together every Saturday and they're all sitting around talking about farming. I didn't know what they were talking about. But then they got talking about plowing the fields and still didn't know what they were talking about. And one of them talked about how the field was being plowed and then it ended up with this big whoop in the middle of the field. And what had happened was he was driving along and they're all teasing each other because that's what they did when they got together. They're all teasing each other. He says, well, what happened? He goes, well, I was driving along and I looked back and when I looked forward, he moved the tractor over a little bit and ended up with bloop in the field. And then he looked at me and he says, you can use that as a sermon illustration someday. You got to keep an eye on where you're going and not what's behind because then everybody knows you're looking behind you. He ended up with this big, he fixed it, but then there was still that section that was still like that, right? So we can't be looking behind us because we're always looking behind us then we'll never get to where we're going. Babe Ruth, one of the best baseball players of all time. I'm not into baseball. I know who this guy is. Well, I never met him. Seeing as he was dead long before I was born. But never met this guy. But everybody knows about Babe Ruth. He knew he hit a few home runs along the way. It took 40 years for somebody to break his record. 714 home runs this guy hit in his career. And he said, never let the fear of striking out get in your way. For 40 years, he held the record of the most home runs in a season. But he also hold, held a second record. He held the record for 30 years for the most strikeouts. Kind of ironic, isn't it? He held the home run one for longer than he did the strikeout one. But 1,330 strikeouts this guy got in his career. He held that record too. How many of us know about the strikeout record versus the home run record? 714 home runs. He had to strike out two times for every time he got a home run. People don't talk about the strikeout record. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. The godly may trip seven times, but they get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. It's because the Lord picks us up. He brushes us off and he helps us move forward. 
1,330 strikeouts before he got his 713, 714 home runs. 714 home runs. Never let the fear of striking out get in your way. If we're always looking back at our strikeouts, we're always looking back at our failures, we're always looking back at, well, this person did that, and that person did that, and this person treated me like this, and well, this happened, well, that happened, and well, I'm not getting up, and I'm going to sit down here in my comfort zone and get comfortable, and I'm not going anywhere. Abraham Lincoln. I'm not an American, but I've heard of this guy, too. Apparently, he was a good president the states had. People liked him. In 19, sorry, 1831, he failed at a business and he went bankrupt. 1833, he was back on his feet, failed a second time. 1835, his fiance drops dead. 1836, he had a nervous breakdown. Well, no kidding. 1838, he runs for Speaker of the House, he gets defeated. 1840, runs for Elector, gets defeated. 1843, runs for Congress, gets was defeated. Runs for Congress again in 1848, was defeated. There should be another nervous breakdown somewhere around here, shouldn't there? 1855, uh, runs for Senate, it's defeated. 1856, runs for Vice President, was defeated. 1860, runs... 1858, runs for Senate. He's defeated. 1860, becomes one of the greatest presidents the United States ever had. How many, one of, how many of us would have given up in 1831? Maybe in 1833. 1835. How many times did that guy, that's right, for 30 years, 29 years, failure after failure after failure after failure, becoming the greatest president the United States ever had. We cannot look at our past and hang on to our past. We need to get back up. The success in life is not how many times you fall down. Success in life is how many times you got back up again. When I was learning to ride a bike, I destroyed a couple of bikes. All seriously. I got a bike. Mom, my dad got me this bike. I get on the, and it was in pieces. He bought it at a, I don't know where he got it from. My uncle got it for him. He got the thing. He assembled it. I got on my bike. I rode down the street for all I had. I had my head down right into the back of my neighbor's van. That bicycle got about 400 feet of riding in it before it was sitting outside for a scrap metal pickup on the Wednesday. <laughs> bent the rim, bent the forks, destroyed the bike. 400 feet. True story. 400 feet out of my first bike. They got me another one. That was their fault. They got me another one, ran into the same van. <laughs> True story. Now I ride a motorcycle. <laughs> it's how many times you get back up again. And one thing I learned about all those times running into that van when I taught our kids how to ride, we did it at the school on the grass. Yeah. There's just trees there to run into. We can look back at our past and see our failures. We can see our hurts and our bitterness. We can look at the, my parents could have said, he's wrecked too many bikes. Problem is, is they knew I was going to get on my sister's bike and wreck it, so they had to keep buying me these cheap junk bikes until I learned how to look up while I was riding. <sighs> you know why there aren't cup holders on motorcycles? It's not because the water will fly out. It's because they don't want to be drink driving like this, right? Let go of the throttle, hold the brake. <sighs> Success is getting back up again, not looking back at our pasts. And you know what? Some people set us up for a fall. Some people might even set us up so that we run right into the wall. Some people might go out of their way and think, I'm going to ruin them. The first church that we went to, 
He gave us the hardest time. He treated us so badly. And I, we're driving along Winter Road. We're driving along. My life on the guy's hands. We're driving on a lake in a pickup truck. And he says to me, and I said to him, why are you treating me so badly? He goes, well, the Lord told me, which the Lord does not tell people this. The Lord told me to give you the hardest time possible so that later on when you have difficulties, you'll be able to survive and succeed. Well, the Holy Spirit that I serve tells you to encourage, uplift, and to, to love, not to tear down, kill, and destroy. Some people go out of their way to try to kill, steal, and destroy you. Just keep in mind, when somebody tries to kill, steal, and destroy, they're not being led. Well, they're being led by a spirit. It's not the spirit of the living God, though. How do we respond? How do we keep moving? Do we get back up again? Do we keep going? We need to forget the past. We need to look forward to what lies ahead. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. John 10, 10. But the thing is, we also need to leave the good behind too. The great memories sometimes are what hold us back. Those great memories, those what it used to be like. I want what it used to be like. A friend of Mickey and I always kept going on and on about how it was way back and how we wanted to get back to that. And that's, the, and that's what he always looked forward to is getting back to that, getting back to that, getting back to that. And I kept saying to him, you don't want that. You want more. You want better. You want to go greater than that. Don't look back at what you had. Look at forward what you can have. He said, I was so close to God. I just want to get there again. You don't want to get there again. You want to go further. You want to go deeper. What it used to be like is what it used to be like. You want more. You want to go deeper. You you can't hang on to that past. Don't limit yourself to just that. Press on. Push forward. Forget about the past. Look to what God has for you. Dream bigger dreams than you've ever dreamed before and go for it. The hardest thing to possibly do as a pastor was to follow Bob Sibley. Bob Sibley was the pastor here for nine years. Remember when June Johnson died? Just after we got here, Gwen, Gwen, I didn't know who she was. June Johnson, I was only here about three weeks when she died. I didn't know who she was. I came here for the Bible study was happening, I came here and Lori Parsons got the photo album out because I had Lorna Warren, June Johnson, and Laura Ty sat in a row together. One of them died. I didn't know which one it was. So they had to show me a picture of who this lady was and Bob Sibley jumped in his car and drove over here because he was going to do the service. And we sat there in his car in June Johnson's driveway and we talked about Bob, Peter Robillard. He was the pastor between Bob Sibley and me. And he said, Peter Robillard didn't have a chance. The congregation wanted Bob Sibley back so badly. I had somebody tell me, you're just a placeholder until Bob Sibley can come back. And Bob Sibley told me, I'm not coming back. And he says it was unfair with the way that Peter Robillard was treated because everybody wanted Bob back. I was four years later after Bob Sibley. We can't look back at the past of what it was. We've got to look forward to what are we going to do next year. How do, we, how do we make it greater? How do we get to this? How do we make it better? We need to look forward. Look forward, not to the past. Yes, it was great when Bob Sibley was here. I know the guy. He was an amazing, he's an amazing guy. He's since retired. He's an amazing guy. He came back for a few funerals. We had him preached a few times. He's a great guy. His son built this and the podium that's sitting in my office. We can't look to the past. We've got to look to the future. Even if the past was amazing. 
good memories can be just as bad as the bad memories. Wind it back to what we had versus looking forward to what God has in store. You need to see what God is doing and he has great things for you for your future. Are you willing to leave the past behind so that you can find your direction in your future? Things change. That's a reality. We can use music as the example. The music 40 years ago, the seniors hated it. Just so you know. The seniors hated the music 40 years ago because it was too new and too ungodly. Now the seniors don't like the music because it's too new and too ungodly. Well, guess what? They didn't like your music. You don't like their music. And in 40 years from now, you're not going to like their music. You know who the author of the music was in heaven? His name was Satan. He knows how to create conflict, and it's in the music. That's what he does. That's the number one conflict. I remember talking to these bunch of pastors and they're all sitting around talking about it. And it's like, how do you solve the music problem in your church? And that is the number one thing in every church. How to solve the music thing. Contemporary, traditional, combination of both. Some churches, what they do is they separate the crowd. You have your traditional service and you have your contemporary service. So that the traditional people can have what they want and the contemporary people can have what they want and the two shall never meet. There's unity for you. Good memories are wonderful to have, but we've got to look forward to what the Lord has in store. I remember Arthur Chant and I, he was my visiting buddy. Arthur was wonderful. And him and I would drive around. We talked about music. And he point blank said, I don't really like this music. But you know what? It says in Psalm 151 that a, no, a nice sound, a, no, oh, how does it go? That a beautiful sound to the Lord. You have all these different instruments and that's what they did and whatever as long as we're worshiping the Lord. And he just put it into perspective for me. Are we willing to let the Lord move us forward? I'd like to have a live band again. I'd love to have a live band again. But you need to have a worship leader to do that. The one thing about not having a live band is, how many times do you have live music and people are having a bickering contest during music practice? You don't have that when it's a live, when it's a canned thing. At least if they did, it would have happened off camera. Good memories can be just as bad as bad memories. Leave it behind. Leave the hurts behind. Leave the, 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 the stuff behind and hang on to what God has for you. He's got something for you. And we've got to strive forward for that. We need to find the direction and get there. We need to find determination. We're going to push on to the finish line. Regardless of how hard it might get, press on to reach the end of the race. Push forward. Push for all you've got. Regardless, even if somebody gets in your way, even if somebody is standing there and you are going to win the race, do you slow down or do you just keep going? People might try to get in your way when you're trying to win the race, when you're trying to get there, but sometimes you just got to push through. Some people do it on purpose. Some people do it by mistake. You know how many people told me when I left for Bible college, it's okay, Bob, if you just can't do it, we'll, let you, we'll be okay when you come home. If you just can't do it, it's okay. You know what, Jim? I couldn't do it. Came out at the bottom of my class. Yes, I did. Almost got kicked out a couple of times. And it was the pastor's kid that told me that, knowing that it was coming from the pastor. It's okay if you can't do it. We'll love you when you have to come back. That was one of the 
best motivational speeches I ever got. I was not coming back. No, they did try to kick me out a couple times because my grades were so bad, but I failed a few classes. Sometimes when people are trying to encourage you, sometimes they're getting in your way. There's one person that we should be taking our encouragement from who's not going to get in your way. It's Jesus himself. Because he has a plan and a future for you that is greater and better than you can ever dream about. He has more interest in you succeeding than you do. And we've got to be determined to push on through the race to get to where he wants us to get. And he has a heavenly prize for you that is so much greater than any metal put around your neck. Are we willing to move forward? Are we willing to fight with determination? Are we willing to not be slowed down? Press on. Fight through the obstacles. Regardless of what might stand in your way, push forward for what he has. How do we move forward in Christ? We find some dissatisfaction. Don't be happy with where you are. Want to go further. Find some devotion. Put him first. Find some direction. Focus on him, not what's behind you, but what's ahead of you. And find some determination and be determined I will get there regardless of what might stand in my way. Push through. Push on. Get there. Because there's a reward at the end and it's Jesus. He's going to give you a crown, and it's going to be beautiful, Jim. But you're going to give it back and lay it at his feet and said, I did it for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we praise you and thank you, God, for all that you are. We thank you, God, that you love us so much. We thank you, God, for how great you are. We thank you, God, for how amazing you are. We thank you, God, for how incredible and awesome you are. And I pray, Jesus, that we don't look forward, we don't look back at the past, but we look forward to what you have, Lord Jesus. We look forward to how great you are, Lord Jesus. We look forward to, to, to your, your glory truth Lord Jesus we push forward we find that determination we don't get satisfied in our comfort zone but we step out of the comfort zone and we go in the direction you want us to go and we find what you want us to find oh Jesus in your precious and holy and glorious name Lord God be high and lifted up Lord Jesus be all glory and honor to you Lord Jesus oh we praise you and we thank you Lord Jesus for how awesome and incredible you are and I pray God that we will find you we'll get to you we'll go to you we'll fight for you we will be determined to get to you Lord Jesus oh we thank you we lift you up on high and we give you all the glory and I thank you God for Pastor Bob Sibley that was here years ago I thank you God for the groundwork that you laid in the time that he was here and the vision that he had to move this church from Lynnhurst to this location and, and all the obstacles of putting this building in place and we thank you, God, for everything you did through him. And I thank you, God, for Peter Robillard and the things that, that you did in this church through his ministry, Lord. And, and um, Pastor Cross before and Pastor Hessler before and Pastor... Those are all the names I can remember. Lord, we just pray, God, you just pour yourself out and may we be a light for you in this community, dear Jesus, and shine your light. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be high and lifted up. All glory and honor to you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we thank you, God. And I thank you, Jesus, for the people of the past, for Arthur Chant and for the, the, the foundation, the people that were foundations of this church that, that were there and pushed on and pushed on and helped. And I thank you, God, for the people that are the foundations now, Lord God. And I pray, Jesus, that we will be able to, to mold and prepare the people that will be the future, that will be the foundation then, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, God, that that foundation is built on the rock on you, Jesus. 
Oh, we thank you, God. And I pray, Jesus, for each one of us, Lord God, that we don't look back at, oh, I used to be there, I used to have this, I used to be like that. I pray, God, that we will look forward to who you are and all that you have in store. We don't hang on to our failures. We don't look, hang on to our, our, those things. But we'll look forward to what you have for each one of us. Jesus, be high and lifted up. Jesus, be all glory and honor to you. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Be all glory and honor and praise to you. Be high and lifted up. In your precious and holy and glorious name, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you and praise you. Be glorified. May we go deeper in you. In Jesus' name, amen.